the Lord's Word, because that's why we've, we're here. Uh, Matthew chapter number 5. I continue this morning with um, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I will be preaching through this until we get to the end. The Sermon on the Mount uh, starts in Matthew chapter 5, 1, and works all the way through to Matthew chapter 7 and the last verse. And so we have been taking the Beatitudes, which it starts out with, and kind of going through them one at a time. Today we are on this beatitude, chapter number 5 and verse number 8, that says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So in order for us to, to keep this passage in context, it's very important for us to understand why is this specific one sequentially being placed where it's at. God does not just uh, work things in chaos. He's a God of order, and He places things in in a specific order. And so we want to see why is it that God has placed this specific one here. If I were to choose one beatitude out of all the beatitudes that would sum up the entire uh, Sermon on the Mount, it would be this one. Remember now the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking and he's teaching his disciples. Uh, he's seated up on the, on the side of a mountain and there he's teaching his disciples and there are the multitudes uh, that are gathered around and Jesus is going to be continually saying to them things like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus is going to start taking that bar of, of the standard and raising it all the way through. He will say things like, you heard it was, uh, it's been said, do not commit murder. But I say, if you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder. He will say things like, you've heard it said, uh, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, that if uh, you would look upon a woman with lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery. You see how he's kind of just raising the bar, raising the bar. Uh, your righteousness should be higher than that of the Pharisees. Oh, the, the Old Testament said this, the 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 the, the Ten Commandments said this, but I say to you, it's not just about action, it's about attitude and thought too. And then he's going to come to a point where he's going to say this, unless you are perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. I mean, that is awesome, isn't it? That, that Jesus has started in saying, this is the Pharisees that you can see now. This is what the Old Testament said, and now this is the ultimate, you need to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, there are those that would say that the Sermon on the Mount is nothing but a, a list of ethical teachings. You know, just do these things and you're going to be fine. I would submit to you today, although ethics are taught in it, it is not a list of ethical teaching. Uh, it is a list that causes us to understand that in and of ourselves, we could never attain this. It is this message, the Sermon on the Mount, that forces us on our knees before the cross of Jesus Christ, that we may call upon His name and be born again. It is this sermon that tells us that regeneration, to be born again, is of absolute necessity. In fact, it's this message that tells us, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you are un able and incapable of attaining the standard. This is an awesome message that Jesus is going to teach. So he starts out in saying this, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now notice he did not say poor financially, he said poor in spirit. This is spiritual bankruptcy. This is coming to the understanding that we're unable to do anything in and of ourselves. Uh, that we are absolutely bankrupt in absolute need for Christ and His righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he says, blessed are those that mourn. And this is not mourning for physical loss. This is mourning for spiritual bankruptcy. And this is a spiritual brokenness. It's understanding that I'm lost without Christ. It's an understanding we've got nothing to give to Him. And hence we mourn over our own sinful state. And then he says, blessed are they who are meek. This idea of meekness is not weakness. Uh, it's not just a humility, but it's a sense of submission to God. Unless you're poor in spirit or mournful, spiritually broken uh, over your own sin, you will never be submitted to God. Never be 
humble before him. And then fourth, he said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When we are poor in spirit or, or spiritually bankrupt, spiritually broken, spiritually submitted, we will absolutely desire hunger and thirst with a zealousness for the righteousness of God, that which we lack, that which we need. And then he said, blessed are the merciful. And we spoke about the mercy that we've received from God and how because much mercy has been shown to us, we can show mercy to those around us. When you understand that, that you are spiritually bankrupt, when you're spiritually broken, when you're spiritually submitted, when you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you'll find it a whole lot easier to be merciful to those around you. And now he says, And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed. What is this word blessed? This word blessed comes from the Greek word makarios, uh, and it does not just mean happy, as in happy clappy, uh, as in, in the sense of happy with happenstance, or those that are things happening around me, but it does mean happy or satisfied are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy or satisfied or content are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. This idea of seeing God is an age-old question. You remember Nicodemus coming to Jesus asking, what must we do to be saved that we might enter the kingdom of God? You remember that lawyer that would come to Jesus and say, what are the works that we should do? You remember the people that came to Jesus and said, what must we do? You remember that rich young ruler that said, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God in order to see God? And so this is the age-old question, and here it is answered for you. If you want to be satisfied, content, blessed, the key to it is it's an exclusive group that will get to see God. Don't let this fly over your head, church. It's an exclusive group that will see God. What do you mean? I'm saying it's not all inclusive. Those that trust in Buddha, they will not see God. Those that trust in Muhammad or Allah will not see God. And those that trust in Confucius will not see God. And those that try to live a good life without the righteousness of Christ will not see God. It is only those, they and they only. The, the Greek term that's used here is this word otos, uh, which is a very strong, and it's in the indicative tense. They and they only will see God. Who? They. They, the, the pure in heart. Not the externalists, but the internalists. This is a direct jab, if you would, or a stab, if you would, at the heart of the Pharisees. They were the ones that were setting goals for everybody else and setting the standards and were keeping the laws and not just keeping the laws, but having laws to make people keep the laws and laws to keep those laws and laws to keep those laws, and they could not keep them. You see, this is not speaking about blessed are the righteous in action, but this is those who are pure in heart. This is the idea that God is always looking at the heart of man. God is always looking at the heart of man, and that is the problem that we have. Yes, and it is a, a, a select group or an exclusive group, the pure in heart, but I think we all have the same problem. And the problem is this, that there is no such thing as wicked as the heart of man. Well, that's our problem. We have wicked hearts. And when I'm speaking about the heart, I'm not speaking about that thing that's going boom, boom in your, in your chest, no. And when your girlfriend comes closer, youth, it goes a little bit faster. And that's not what we're speaking about. No, no, we're speaking about the center of the being. And I'll speak about that in a moment. But the problem for the human is the heart. God looks at the heart. It was Stephen Lawson that said this. He said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. That we have all been born into sin. 
that we have a sin nature, that our desire by nature is ourselves. Uh, our hearts are wicked beyond anything. There's nothing in us that desires God. In fact, in Ephesians, the apostle Paul will say to us that we were by nature the objects of the wrath of God, that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. But God, in His great love and mercy, would purchase us. Jesus would condemn these Pharisees because of their heart. You remember those times that He would look at them and call them whitewashed sepulchres or whitewashed tombs? You remember that? He says, on the outside you look so awesome, but on the inside there's nothing but dead man's bones. And then He would say to them, why do you clean the dish on the outside. You clean the dish on the inside and it will be clean. And that is what we're facing right here. As Jesus is speaking of purity of heart, he's saying this, I'm not just looking at your actions, I am looking at your heart and what I desire from your heart is the word katharos. Uh, it is the Greek word katharos and it is that word that we use for catharize, uh, to catheterize something, or, or to, to cauterize, to, what, what is the word, um, catharsis, uh, did someone say catharsis? Thank you. To clean it out, to clean it, to, to, to remove all impurities, to make it without spot, uh, to, to make it absolutely singular. I remember going with dad on the gold mines, and, and he would take us into the, the, what they would call a smelt house. And in the smelt house, they would, they would take the, the, the gold and they would smelt it, hence smelt house. Uh, they would melt it and, and it would be poured out into these, these uh, molds and hence you'd get your blocks or a cone of gold or a nugget of gold. And the most amazing thing as we would stand and watch that uh, is that as it would come down, there would be a, a little bit of black on the top and a lot of smoke. And what that is, is it's the, the impurities, it's what we may call the dross that has risen to the top, it's been burnt out, and as it would land in those forms, they would knock off the dross, and knock off the impurities, that it was singular, it was of one makeup, and that was gold, pure, without alloy. And so this is what Jesus is saying, he's saying blessed are those who have a singular heart, a heart that's without mixture, without alloy, without sin, that is morally pure and exercised toward Christ. Blessed are those people. They shall see God. Not only they shall see God, but they and they only shall see God. Purity. The Bible speaks of various kinds of purity. For those that are taking notes, I'll just shout some out for you for your own study. Theologians speak of primitive purity, which exists in God and God alone. They speak of created purity, which is created in His image before the fall. Ultimate purity, where we will be glorified when we be with our Lord and pure as He is. Positional purity meaning the imputation of Christ, and lastly, practical purity, and this is sanctification, the process that we go through. So purity, is this a new thing? Uh, is, is this something that Jesus made up for this Sermon on the Mount? I, I would submit to you this morning that that's not the case at all. In fact, when you go back to the Old Testament, you're going to find that purity was of utmost utmost importance. Uh, you go to the, the priests, as the priests would go into the temple, and they would come before the, the laver, and there they would wash and purify themselves, clean themselves, because nothing impure could enter into the presence of God. Uh, you go into the, the Holy of Holies, there where the mercy seat is situated, and you find the blood of the lamb, or, or the, that, that animal that it was slaughtered, is poured out on the mercy seat, why? To purify the people of their sin or to cover their sin. Purity has always been important in the Old Testament. It is 
pointed out to us. Uh, it is pictured in the sacrificial system. Uh, it is pictured uh, in the purification rituals. Uh, it is pictured all the way through the Old Testament. Not only is it pictured, but it is also promised in the Old Testament. Listen to these passages as I read them, and I'll read them very fast for you. Isaiah 1, 18 said, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Zechariah said, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Ezekiel 18, 31 the Israelites were told to cast away from you all transgression that you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Then chapter 36, he picks up this idea of the heart again from a heart of stone. Listen to this. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit will, I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Let me stop here before I read any further. If God has removed your heart of stone, that was hardened toward God and has given you a heart of flesh that is tender toward Christ and He's put His Spirit within you. He will, listen to this, not He might, He could, He will cause you to walk in His statutes and His precepts. It is impossible for one who has come to Christ to continue in sin. What do you mean? Believers don't sin? No, that's not what I said. We all mess up, right? But if we're continuing in sin, continuing to do, that is not a sign of a believer. That's a sign that you never were saved. You do not have the Spirit of God within you. You're lost. You will not see God. He says, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from your uncleanness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no, no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer this grace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourself for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What are you going to say, Lord? On the day I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will then cause your cities to be inhabited and waste places to be rebuilt. Now, I understand the, the, the messianic idea there. I understand the future prophecy that is spoken of here. But I want you to understand this very clearly, that God is all about the pure-hearted. Others may look at your actions, and you may be able to raise a hand at the right time. We may be able to sing the songs at the right time. We may be able to pray the prayers at the right time. But listen, friend, God is looking at the heart. And the heart that he's desirous of is a heart that is pure. You remember David, when David was chosen to be the king, and Jesse would parade all his sons before the prophet. And, and every time God would say, not this one, not this one, not this one. And eventually they get down to the runt of the litter, David. And the Lord says, this one. And Jesse's like, are you sure? This is the runt. And he says, of course I'm sure. Because God does not look at the things that man looks at. God looks at the heart. Church, can I ask you today, what is the condition 
of our hearts. Are our hearts pure, without alloy, singular, focused on Christ, purified by the blood of Jesus, imputed righteousness placed upon us positionally in Christ and practically walking in the Spirit, becoming more and more like Jesus. You see, God is looking at the heart. So what is the heart? I'm glad you asked. The heart is the center of the being. You have a body, that's what you can see. And then you have this thing called a soul, and that is divided into three things. At the moment you're using one of them, you're thinking, the mind. Then there's another part of you, it's called emotions. Right now you may feel your emotions. And then the last one is volition or will. So this is the way we do it. I know what I should do, Lord. I'm convicted, my feelings, Lord. I exercise my volition, my will toward you. That's the heart of man. It is everything encompassing of who we are. It's not just the things we do. It's the thoughts we think, the feelings or, or the attitudes that we have, and the things we do. It's a head heart and hand knowledge that is controlled by God, recklessly abandoned to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the pure heart. And it all begins with receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can try to control your thoughts. You can try to control your emotions and your attitudes. You can do all the works of the hands as much as you possibly can, but still have a heart that is black as black as soot. The only thing that can purify the heart is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is His blood that purifies us. That is why in Isaiah He would say, Come, let us reason. Although your, your, your sins are as scarlet, I will make them as white. You see, it's when we trust in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the pure Lamb of God, without blemish or defect. The one that lived the perfect life and died the perfect death and was raised to life again that we might have life. When we trust Him in that moment, when we repent of our sin, when we surrender ourselves to Christ, when we turn from the world and we give ourselves to Jesus Christ, in that moment our hearts are purified as we receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. Have you been born again? Well, that's some spiritual mumbo-jumbo right there, preacher. Oh, no, it's not. Nicodemus said to, to Jesus, what shall we do? How shall we enter the kingdom of God? And he said, unless a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. He did not say, unless a man keep the Ten Commandments, unless a man attend church tithes, be baptized, uh, and, and be the best Sunday school teacher, and serve as a deacon, and even a preacher, they shall see the kingdom of God. That's not what he said. He said this, lest a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. Why must we be born again? Because we're dead in trespasses and sin. And now we need to be born into the family of God. It's at that point that positionally we are in Christ, a done deal. And now we go through practical righteousness. This is the idea of the mind being transformed by the Word of God. This is daily purifying of the heart. This is daily doing the works of Him who's called us. Wow, that sounds like work. No, it's not. If you're not doing that, you're not saved. Because it's not us. It's Him working His life through us. Listen, this is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is not what we can do for Him. This is not what we can do to be saved. It's because we are saved, He causes us to want to live for righteousness' sake. It all happens in the heart. The mind, the emotion, and the volition. So let me close with this thought then. 
if it is then that God has saved you, that you've trusted Christ, you've been born again, how do you maintain that? And I'm not saying maintain your salvation. Remember, he's the author and perfecter. You can't earn it, you can't lose it. How do you maintain it, though? I mean, I want to walk in righteousness, don't you? That, that, that is, is what the Holy Spirit places. He's the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? Uh, he's the Holy Spirit. He, he, he causes us to want to live in righteousness. But what can I do that my heart may be singular on Christ? Here are some things. Firstly, there needs to be a daily washing in the Word of God. A daily washing in the Word of God. Uh, th this is what Jesus uh, spoke about, and this is what Paul would write about in Ephesians 5 when he would say to cleanse the church with the daily washing of the Word. Uh, th this is what Jesus would pray in, in John 17, 17, when he would pray for his disciples, and he would say to the Father, Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. And so that sanctifying, that changing, that practical righteousness, that process that we're going through as we wait for that day of glorification, part of that is the washing in the Word of God. God's Word has the power. It is a double-edged sword. It is live and active. God's Word is a mirror. It reflects the sin in our lives, and the Spirit of God applies it to our hearts, and He changes us, and He is the one that does the work of sanctification. I love this quote. I wrote it down uh, for those who are in the medical field. I'm, I think you may like this. For us who are not, you're going to find it really gory, but that's okay. An author said this, the preachers of old would take the razor-like scalpel of Scripture and lance the boils of our corruption, cutting out the cancers of our God-belittling habits of mind and amputate the limbs of our disobedience. Wow. Isn't that powerful? That he would take the razor-like scalpel and lance the boils of our corruption? That he would take it and he would cut out the, the cancer of our God-belittling thoughts of mind? And that he would take it and he would amputate the limbs of our disobedience? How does that happen? I believe it happens in the daily study of the Word of God. Oh, brother and sister in Christ, I implore you this morning, bathe, soak yourself, saturate yourself in God's Word, and He will use it to purify you daily. So there's the daily washing in the Word. There's the daily bathing in the blood. Now, this is what Zechariah meant when he said, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. This is that fountain that flows from Emmanuel's vein. That's the idea of this fountain of blood that Christ died to purify us. This is the daily purifying also where he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Oh, that we would keep a short list of our sin. Keep a short list. Oh, that we would go back to Him daily calling on His name. Thirdly, the submission to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. This is we walk in holiness. This is where we walk and we desire the things He desires and we hate the things He hates. We are slaying the earthly and seeking the heavenly. We are walking in the Spirit of God daily. You see, Galatians 6, sorry, Galatians 5 says that the Spirit and the flesh are at enmity with each other. They, they're in conflict with each other. They, they're fighting one another. And we get a choice whether we choose to obey the Spirit of God or we choose to obey the flesh. But let me tell you who you obey will be your master. They have sown to the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. 
they have sown to the flesh, and from that same flesh they will reap damnation. But those that sow to the Spirit, from that same Spirit, will reap eternal life. To whom do you submit daily, church? Number four, pray for purity. What do you mean pray for purity? Well, this is what Thomas Watson said, one of the Puritans from days gone by. He said, until sin becomes bitter to you, Jesus will never be sweet. Until sin becomes bitter to you, Jesus will never be sweet. And when, you're, when sin is bitter, you cannot stand it. Uh, you're dead to sin. When sin comes and knocks on your door, you, you lock it and you, you double lock it and you, you padlock it and, and you barricade it and you run and you say, I've died to you. There's no place for you here. We fall on our knees and like David said in Psalm 51, Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy, gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Listen to this, church. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. That sounds like a powerful prayer, doesn't it? I think it's one that we can follow. Your time is up. But I will not end until you hear the good news. There's a great privilege. There's a great privilege. And here it is. They will see God. Not might, not could. They will see God. Well, what is this? When is this? Uh, is it in the day, one day, in the sweet by and by? Is it, is, how is this? Is this a vision? What is this? I believe it's now and it's then. It's now seeing him with the eyes of faith. It is now living in light of who he is. And this is what the Apostle Paul would, would tell us when he would say, to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. What eyes? These eyes? No, you can't see him. Now we, we live by faith. Then we will live by sight. But now we fix our eyes on him. Now we have our eyes enlightened. That is what Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 18. Stephen Lawson said, when sin moves into our lives, the vision of Christ moves out. When sin moves into our lives, the vision of Christ moves out. I've told the story so many times at this church, but I'll tell it again. I love my dad. My dad's my hero. When I was a, just a, a little boy, 12 years old, I started smoking cigarettes. I quit when I was 27, so I only did that for 15 years. Oh, how many is that, 15? Gosh, that's a long time. But this is what I do. I, I would smoke cigarettes, and when Daddy would get home, I'd jump in the shower. I would wash myself on the outside that he couldn't smell the smoke on me. I would suck down a tube of Aquafresh. I was excellent. I go, and that thing was gone. And you know what? He would not smell me. But when he would come home and I would be freshly clean on the outside, wonderful breath, somehow when he said, come sit here with me, my boy, and we're going to watch rugby together, I felt so uncomfortable sitting next to my dad. Because I knew what was on the inside. There was no fellowship with my dad. Could it be today that you're not able to see him with the eyes of faith? That you're not able to have fellowship with him today because sin has moved in and the vision of God has moved out. The fellowship with him has gone out. Now, I'm not saying your relationship's changed. If you're saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior... He'll always be your father. He'll always be his child. But there can be a break in that fellowship, that intimacy. But no, it's not only speaking about now 
living today with a vision of Him, living in faith, seeing what He's doing, embracing what He's doing, but it's also eternally. There's going to come a day that we will enter into the very presence of God. And I can't wait. That day when heaven's gates open and, and He bolts out on a white steed, whoo! Boy, I tell you what, I can't wait for that day. In fact, I wish some days he would come today, and then I say, wait a minute, I've got some family and friends that need to come to you first. Don't come now. But you know, for us as believers that have been purified by Christ, we've trusted him, there's going to come a day when we will see him face to face. Then it will no longer be imputed righteousness, but imparted righteousness. Well, listen to this. Beloved, 1 John chapter number 3, verses 2 and 3 says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Not will be, we are now. And what we will be, future tense, has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. And we shall see him as he is. Why? Because we'll be as he is. Oh, let's not forget. And everyone who has thus hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Wow. Can't begin to tell you how much I look forward to seeing Jesus. enter into his very presence but it's only those that have been purified by Christ saved positionally pure and then his Holy Spirit does the work of practical purity sanctifying us why is this important it's important because of this one verse Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 27 speaking about heaven this is after the consummation the old earth and the old heavens have passed away and there's a new heaven and a new earth and speaking about that holy city Revelation 21 27 says nothing unclean will ever enter Not anyone who does what is detestable and false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's pretty clear cut, isn't it? Heaven is perfect because there is no sin there. No sin will ever enter heaven, and hence we need the righteousness of Christ to enter into heaven. Every sin soils the soul, said Bishop Westcott. We should be about the work of mortification of sin. Jesus said to be drastic. He said if your eye causes you to sin, to rip it out. We're not, we're not speaking about an amputation. We're speaking about mortification. To take sin seriously, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to take drastic steps to eradicate the old nature to stand strongly and say, for I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I am dead to sin. What about you, church? Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? I'm going to ask the deacons to come, and they're going to be officiating at the table this morning. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I need to ask you this question tonight, this morning. Is this, are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You say, yes, Anton, I have. Then I ask you, how do you know? What is the fruit of your life? Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. This table we come to this morning 
at Lakewood Church, we have an open table. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it's open to everyone. It does mean you do not need to be a member of this church, but you do. Listen to this. You do need to be a member of the family of God. In other words, you must have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Secondly, Jesus said that we are to, to judge ourselves, to make sure that there's nothing unclean in us before we participate. And so we're going to take a moment and give you that opportunity. Would you search your heart this morning? Is there something that would hinder you from participating in this table? If so, I would encourage you, just let it pass you by. Do not eat and drink judgment upon yourself this morning. This table is exclusively for the family. So, Father, we pray that you would bless each one in this room. Lord, if there be one in this room that does not know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would impress upon them their need to turn to Christ. And Lord, if there be believers in this room that uh, are struggling with sin and, God, their hearts are not pure, I, I pray that you would draw them to yourself and, God, that you would grant them repentance that they may continue to trust you for the forgiveness of their sin. Lord, that you would give them victory over their sin. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us on that cross. And so as we eat of the bread, we remember that your body was broken on that rugged cross for us. Your blood was shed on that cross. Lord, your word tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And uh, Lord, you went to the cross just for us. And so we want to thank you for your blood that was shed for us. And so as we partake now, God, I pray that you would help us to remember the sacrifice that you've made. And Lord, that you would continue to encourage our hearts to be sold out, single-minded, single-hearted, focused on you and your glory. May you be exalted today, Lord Jesus. We pray in your mighty name.